this Janmuna lecture is organized in cooperation between uh, Janmuna centers, uh, centers of Excellence in Maastricht and Manchester. And today we have a very special guest, a Czech diplomat and a politician, Stefan uh, Fule. Mr. Fule served as an ambassador of Czech Republic to NATO, Lithuania, UK. He also held positions in Czech government. And in 2010-2014, he was EU Commissioner for Enlargement and European Neighborhood Policy. Currently, he's an advisor to the President of Uzbekistan. And Mr. Fulai will give a short lecture on the topic the European Union's foreign actorness in its neighborhood, perceptions and reality. And after this, uh, everybody will have a chance to ask the questions. Uh, so you can uh, uh, write them in Q&A. Q&A, Q yes, not in chat, but in Q&A. So uh, please write them down and uh, we will try to answer them. So Mr. Fille, uh, welcome. We are very happy uh, to have you with us. Thank you very much. And uh, many thanks for the invitation. Um, I have to admit that I would prefer much more to be with you in Maastricht uh, and have uh, a personal contact uh, and seeing the faces sort of behind that screen, the screen. But uh, this is the best we can come up with. Uh, uh, so let's try to do it in a, in a most proper uh, way. I have also to admit one more thing that Alina was kind enough to put, to put my picture in the poster where I looked much, much, much younger than, than I am. So uh, Alina, next time, please. Uh, and the last uh, comment at the uh, beginning, uh, uh, let's agree on one thing. This is not a kind of fact-finding mission, okay? I'm not trying to substitute internet you have on your split screen where you could check all the facts and, and all of that. Huh? That's not necessarily uh, what I'm, I expect, supposed to do. I'd like to give you my um, impression about uh, what has happened. Uh, at what time uh, and why. Um, um, and let's see whether we'll be able to do the proper job. <laughs> Let me start uh, uh, with uh, the first remark. The first remark, Apantare, everything is changing. And there is one, only one organization uh, uh, in the globe which actually uh, is, is changing by its own definition, and it is the European Union. It has been um, uh, said a couple of times to me that it's like uh, uh, riding the bicycle. I mean, once you stop uh, riding, I mean, you, you fall. So when you stop reforming, changing the European Union, that's going to be uh, the, the end of the European Union. And I, and I sympathize with that. I, I do, because uh, what we are doing with the European Union project is something completely new. There is no uh, book uh, on it, may only book what has happened, but not really uh, an example to follow uh, from the uh, history of the, of the mankind. Uh, and uh, the best we can do is to change the institution, uh, you know, to be able to work in the ideal conditions we can imagine. And the biggest job we have is to adjust that ideal conditions do not uh, 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 exist even in the physics, not to mention uh, uh, our world. Uh, so uh, it's each and every crisis every challenge to turn into a possibility to make a stronger, more effective uh, um, uh, organization. Now, uh, there have been a number of important uh, changes with the Lisbon Treaty. Um, actually, the Lisbon Treaty and my government uh, uh, is responsible for a uh, second Barroso team uh, to be the only commission not to serve five full years, because President Klaus at that time uh, has holed up the ratification process in Czech Republic, the Lisbon Treaty, ch challenging the ratification in the Constitutional Court. Uh, and uh, uh, so we have not started a 2000, um, um, 
nine uh, in November, but February 2010, as Alina said at the, at the beginning. But the changes which Lisbon has brought were tremendous. Uh, uh, and I have come exactly at the time when, uh, when actually what later on became an external action service was a DG Relax, which I was for one year in charge of. Um, um, we have uh, the start of the external action service. We have for the first time, uh, the high representative was also the vice president uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the commission. We have um, uh, ended, uh, we have ended the, uh, uh, the practice of rotating presidency role on the issues of the foreign policies. We have subsequently also uh, changed the practice that every six months you have uh, in capitals of our partners uh, and allies, a different uh, member states presiding over the EU agenda in relations to that country, including of course in our close uh, neighborhood. And that has changed. We have created the EU uh, embassies and stopped them also uh, uh, um, appropriately. Uh, so a lot of positive changes. By the same time, uh, two important constraints. Uh, uh, the first important constraint was parallelism. We have created the kind of uh, EU foreign policy. By the same time, it was up to the member states, of course, to uh, uh, pursue their own uh, uh, bilateral multilateral policies. So we have had and still have uh, 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 two policies at the same time. I mean, the EU uh, and the member states. And uh, I cannot say that the situation today is better, but uh, at the time when I was uh, in the commission, I sometimes uh, uh, said that we do not, with the external action service and the changes to Lisbon, we do not have, and at that time the UK was the member states and Croatia was was not. So we had uh, uh, 27 uh, um, uh, member states. And I said, uh, instead of having one coherent policy, we have not 27, we have not one, but we have 28. We have 27 policies of the member states plus the one of the, of the EU. And another constraint was uh, unanimity that uh, uh, despite the efforts uh, of my uh, successors, uh, you still have uh, uh, the issues in relations to the foreign security, to the, to the foreign relations, to the foreign policy, uh, to the security and defense, uh, 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 the decisions are taken on the basis of, of unanimity. Um, that, of course, uh, creates difficulties, uh, particularly vis-a-vis -vis, uh, our neighborhood. But turning to neighborhood, uh, let me give you, because that policy has changed, I mean, as institutional framework of the European Union has changed, so has changed our policy. I'll give you just a headline. So it's uh, 2004, uh, well, neighborhood policy. Uh, we would uh, come back uh, to that. The headline was, Let's create a circle of friends. Uh, 2010, that was already, I had my fingers uh, uh, in that. It was a policy more for more uh, uh, and optimistic and policy of many people saying optimistic transformative commitments. Um, I have to say I'm still supporter of that rather than of uh, other policies I'm going to mention. Then uh, in 2016, uh, uh, successor of, uh, of Kathy Ashton came out with the following headlines, resilience and our interests are important and let's turn to geopolitics. That was very much a, a, a headline of the strategic paper in 2016. 
And what can I say about uh, uh, 2020? It's stability written all over uh, 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 the room. Uh, uh, and uh, that's what we are seeking and uh, in, uh, uh, in not only in our uh, neighborhood. But there are some, some changes, so we will come back uh, 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 to that. By the way, one of the change, let me uh, mentioned right now, this is the European Union strategic compass. Uh, uh, this is something what the defense ministers are debating, the foreign ministers, uh, what should be some practical roadmap, uh, I mean, how to uh, build uh, on what we already have, uh, 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 this European uh, security and, and, and defense. And we could come back to the relationship to NATO later on if you are uh, interested through the Q, uh, Q&A. Now, uh, before we move uh, to uh, various uh, uh, kinds of neighborhood, uh, let me mention the Euro-Mediterranean Partnership of uh, 1995, which precedes uh, the neighborhood policy, which I already mentioned uh, in 2000, being adopted in 2004. But let me mention one important uh, uh, element. Uh, you know, why neighborhood policy at that time, huh? 2004? If you look at the calendar, what has happened also at that time, you will uh, uh, realize that uh, uh, 10 new members uh, uh, arrived uh, um, uh, to Brussels, to the EU institutions, and so on. And at that time, um, uh, Prode, the president of the commission, was very keen not to uh, uh, move the hard border between the EU uh, and the new members which were there before we joined to the east borders of the new members. So from the very beginning of uh, us joining the European Union, and I was happy to be one of uh, those from the new member states, uh, the um, uh, Commission at that time has made sure that the new neighbors of the European Union have uh, in their hands quite an ambitious uh, policy. Uh, uh, they could choose and negotiate uh, with the European Union uh, to match their ambitions. Uh, now, let me turn to the South Southern neighborhood because that uh, has been probably the biggest wake up call for me and uh, my colleagues when I was in the commission, those 28 days at the end of 2010, at the beginning of 2011 has shaken not only the world, but first of most uh, our institutions. And uh, frankly speaking, my most difficult moment uh, when I was commissioner was uh, my first trip to Tunisia after uh, 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 the events um, and getting the questions, uh, where have you been? Where have you been all those years? Uh, where we, I mean, the, the, the civil society were striving for the very, very values you are saying you defend. Huh? Where was your lighthouse? Huh? Uh, uh, what has happened? I mean, how dare, you know, that you worked uh, with, uh, uh, you know, dictators. Uh, those were extremely difficult. Uh, uh, actually, very easy questions, but it was not easy to answer them. But I think uh, uh, we took uh, uh, the lessons. Uh, uh, I have to say, just uh, as a small defense, uh, that at the time, as I said at the beginning, or uh, indicated at the beginning, the policy was very much in the hands uh, uh, of, of the member states uh, uh, rather than institutions. We did not have external action service at that time and so on. Uh, uh, so there were some trade-offs which were uh, made at the bilateral basis between the member states uh, and the regimes and not only, uh, not only in, in Tunisia. And uh, my priority together with, with Kathy Ashton was, uh, you know, 
to make the dramatic shift and uh, uh, to turn the ex external action service indeed in, in the most important transformative uh, uh, instrument. Um, uh, we have come out in an extremely short period of the time, taking into account the experience in the European Union with a spring program to support uh, uh, the changes, uh, uh, and not only in, in Tunisia at the beginning of 2011. We have come out with a privileged uh, partnership based on an upgraded uh, action plan. So, we have uh, uh, started to negotiating uh, the DCFTA, which is a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement. You will hear about it uh, uh, later on. Um, we have come out with a mobility partnership, uh, which was uh, adopted on the bilateral basis, rather, between a number of the member states uh, and uh, uh, Tunisia and some other countries. Uh, uh, just uh, uh, Talking about money, and that's probably the least uh, uh, what was on the mind of those who protested, uh, but was still important because we made specifically an extra efforts that all those money, every euro, would be to uh, assist them uh, uh, to change the situation on the ground. Uh, in the years 2014, 2020 Tunisia alone um, um, has been receiving uh, around 150, 15, 115 million euros uh, a year. Uh, and, uh, and those are not loans. Uh, Union for Mediterranean, that was um, um, uh, another important institutional framework for regional cooperation. So, 15 uh, countries of the region uh, uh, and 27 member, member states. Uh, kind of trade off uh, 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 when uh, the French president uh, 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 pushed this idea of Union for Mediterranean and the Sweden, Poland, and to a certain extent, the Czech Republic pushed for the Eastern Partnership. I'll, I'll come back uh, to that. Uh, the Union for Mediterranean was at the beginning uh, 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 on the co-chaired uh, basis, one member of the European Union and a member from, from the region, but it later on, we succeeded the European Union, its new institutions uh, and, and the, the, the potential we have built uh, concerning the uh, uh, human resources, financial resources, uh, uh, ability to uh, uh, pursue the structural dialogue, uh, we have succeeded uh, the, the member states on that rotating, uh, uh, on that rotating pre presidency. Now, uh, if you compare this situation with today, you, you have, of course, to ask uh, uh, what, uh, what has paid off, what has not, uh, whether we have done everything uh, possible. I think uh, one, uh, one thing you might say quite uh, clearly is that uh, democratization and Tunisia was not the only example has brought uh, uh, also uh, a lot of instability uh, in the country and sometimes unfortunately also in the region. And I will come back to that and when I will be talking about the Eastern uh, Partnership. But it was so special moment uh, uh, to allow for synergies and complementarity between the European Union on one side and its partners in the in the neighborhood, and and I'm despite a certain setbacks, uh, uh, and I I think I'm on the record uh, 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 to say it a couple of times, we have never made a promises that the transformation would be quick, without challenges, and only only peaceful. But I'm still uh, optimist uh, uh, when it comes that once you open this, uh, 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 once you open the opportunities, once you give the people the possibility, not only to dream about their future, but also to do something, you know, the people uh, will not let anyone to take it from them, whatever the 
challenges and difficulties they, they face. Now, that brings me to the Eastern uh, uh, neighborhood and Eastern partnership, which uh, started more or less uh, as the, this Union for Mediterranean. There, the situation was a little bit different because at that time, uh, when I joined the, the European uh, uh, Commission, we have already started uh, uh, negotiating really a far reaching uh, agreement, uh, uh, agreements of new generation. It's called association agreements and deep and comprehensive free trade uh, uh, um, area. Uh, the point of, uh, of this, DC, of this uh, DCFTA in particular was to bring uh, our Eastern partners as close to the European Union as, as possible. Uh, to uh, involve them uh, and bringing, bringing them as a part uh, of uh, our common market on the conditions we negotiate with each and every partners when it comes to the uh, level of ambitions and the speed with which they would uh, take on themselves a number of, of important uh, commitments. You know the story, we started the negotiations with uh, uh, five of them. Uh, Belarus was out uh, from uh, the very uh, beginning. And we have uh, uh, finished the negotiations with only, with only uh, uh, four of them. Actually, three of them, because the fourth one, Armenia, has uh, uh, the foreign minister called me in, in the summer 2003 saying uh, that he needs to talk to me uh, very urgently. And then uh, he told me the whole story about uh, them in a couple of days going to Moscow uh, to sign, of course, uh, 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 on the basis of free will, uh, 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 to sign a uh, memorandum on Armenia joining, uh, at that time, still the customs union, which then evolved in the Eurasian economic, uh, uh, economic Union. This is, by the way, an interesting uh, issue. If someone is interested uh, in it, uh, 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 put it in a chat and a Q&A, um, and I will come back um, um, uh, to that. Um, we... We have felt uh, 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 that uh, uh, something uh, uh, might be coming, but it was not clear at that time uh, what it will be. Because interestingly enough, uh, 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 and that is not uh, unfortunately uh, a matter of common knowledge, because that uh, uh, reference has disappeared from Kremlin uh, 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 that. Uh, President Putin, uh, when he visited uh, Ukraine, uh, and, and, and kill me, uh, uh, I, I don't remember now the, the year, but it was, it was still, it, it was already at the time we have been in the middle of negotiations of the association agreement and DCFTA with Ukraine. And he uh, got the questions from the journalists about the possible of the Ukrainian membership in the European Union. And he answered in an interesting way. He said, uh, uh, listen, I, uh, if, if anyone would be interested in, U in Ukraine becoming uh, uh, the EU member states, uh, I mean, taking into account that, uh, you know, we have a very close uh, 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 contacts, relationship, and cooperation, particularly with the east of east of Ukraine, it it, it might happen to be a, a positive also uh, for us. What I'm trying to say uh, uh, at that time, everyone knew about the Russian position on on the NATO expansion. Huh? And those of us uh, uh, sitting in Bucharest uh, summit of, of, of NATO, which for the first time uh, uh, adopted a resolution in which 
it promised actually membership to Ukraine and Georgia. Some of you might remember, or you might get across uh, in your research, uh, this uh, um, uh, communique from Bucharest summit uh, uh, makes it clear that Ukraine and uh, Georgia will become uh, the NATO member state. Now, the next day we had the NATO Russia Council with, with Putin, and he was reading his statement, uh, and then he uh, mentioned uh, uh, Ukraine, and he stopped, he looked at us and said, are you really interested in having this artificial country, artificial country, Ukraine, uh, uh, to become a member state of NATO? I have to tell you uh, honestly that half of us laughed uh, because uh, they didn't know. I mean, they, they, they thought it was a good joke. Uh, and the second half did not understand the message at all. And uh, uh, only a couple of months after the Bucharest summit, uh, you know what has happened in Georgia. Uh, uh, so um, Putin already at that time uh, has uh, learned that uh, we were bluffing big way, bluffing big way. By the way, the, this, this membership uh, uh, issue, uh, if you look at the NATO and the European Union, <clears throat> uh, so the NATO, as we, as we just uh, uh, talked about, uh, uh, it has promised, uh, you know, you will get this light at the end of the tunnel. But at the same time, in Bucharest uh, uh, summit, they refused to adopt the membership action plan. So they did not tell the Ukraine and Georgia how to get there, to that light. We in the European Union made the same mistakes, although, you know, on, on, a, on a completely opposite uh, uh, um, argument, huh? because uh, through the association agreement and DCFTA, we actually have given our Eastern partners the best possible recipe, how to not only get closer to the European Union, but how to actually become eligible uh, 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 for membership in the European Union. So we, we gave them this way, but we told them, don't touch the light. We will not give you uh, 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 this uh, uh, light at the end of the tunnel, and we will never, in any of the documents, and some member states were really very uh, in, in, in insisting, they very insisted on it. Uh, uh, they never uh, allowed, uh, any reference for some eventuality of the EU membership uh, for some of those Eastern countries who would have this ambition. Uh, so, and, I, and I'm afraid that we paying the price for our lack of consistency here, what we're facing, uh, what we're facing uh, uh, today. Now we, we made, three mistake, I think, uh, when it comes to the Ukraine um, and the rest of the Eastern partners. If you, if you look at, 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 uh, at Eastern partnership and, and Russia, we had at that time a very consensual and ambitious policy vis-a-vis -vis our Eastern partners. But we have no consistent and no ambitious policy. And there was no consensus on, on any policy on Russia. You remember when a couple of minutes ago, I was talking about Prodi and about uh, neighborhood uh, uh, policy, why it was so important at the time of enlargement, you know, when we moving the borders towards the East, we immediately sort of uh, put in front of our East partners, some kind of ambitious program, agenda for interaction. We did not do that at that time. We just, we just moved uh, uh, this ambitious, consensual uh, 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 policy 
to the Ukraine, Russia, uh, Moldova, Russia um, borders and let it up to our partners to figure it out what, what to do, what to do with, uh, um, with that. The second mistake was that at the time before Vilnius summit, uh, 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 we have focused so much on U particularly Ukraine to fulfill what I at that time have interpreted, put as a, as a nine conditions uh, 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 for us to sign the association agreement with, uh, with, with them, that we have, uh, we have forgotten that uh, some of our member states might not be that enthusiastic about the association agreement uh, um, uh, and, uh, and the DCFTA. By the way, one of the irony uh, was that uh, at the Vilnius summit itself, uh, um, I was still trying with the Ukrainian uh, deputy prime minister to move the things forward. Uh, um, an interesting thing is uh, at that time, the Ukrainian government had uh, uh, credentials uh, to sign the agreement because they adopted it a couple of weeks ago and no one has re repealed that, that decision of the government. But the European Union, which, which was saying, I mean, we are interested, we have not approved this. I mean, the people were ready, I mean, to be fair, the people were ready in Brussels, you know, on the call, uh, uh, you know, to meet in a, in a respective format, to make a formal, uh, to make a formal uh, uh, decision. But an interesting thing was uh, uh, the Ukrainian government who had uh, 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 actually all the credentials to sign it refused to do it. And us, we did not have at that time any paper to, to uh, you know, um, um, to, to sign it. We actually uh, were the one who said, uh, uh, we are ready. Uh, so, but, there are more than this one irony when it comes to the foreign policy, the EU and uh, a neighborhood. Now, enlargement, that's a third type uh, of, of our neighborhood. And, and uh, let me say it at the very beginning, uh, what I'm actually put uh, uh, on my note as, as a last point. The enlargement, without any doubt, is the most transformative and most powerful transformative instrument we have. There is nothing more powerful than the enlargement. You cannot do with three armies what I can do with 35 chapters of the European Union Aki and a, and a couple of years transforming the country. And it's so sad to see actually the only new member states uh, uh, joining uh, uh, the European Union, Union when I was the, the, the commissioner, no, no further enlargement. It's so sad to see that, uh, uh, that, that the door, despite the political rhetoric, uh, 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 are tightly, tightly closed. Uh, um, uh, it's sad, but, but we, would, uh, we would come uh, to that. Um, we have been working uh, with, uh, and my successors, uh, uh, with not only individual candidate countries and aspirants, but also uh, as a region as a whole. Uh, we have come out with uh, the six region, with the regional format of six. We have persuaded, despite uh, some initial objections um, uh, and uh, me being accused. Uh, in media of one or two uh, uh, enlargement countries of, as of trying to resurrect uh, uh, the former Yugoslavia. We try to persuade the countries, listen, work together, the six of us. The more you work together, the easier job you will have to join the European Union, the easier job uh, we all will have to persuade uh, the member states. Huh? And why to wait, uh, that was the first uh, uh, reason. The second re reasons, why to wait with some informal, uh, uh, some important uh, projects like uh, 
in, like transport and energy infrastructure, making it to reach out uh, the Western Balkan countries even before they joined the European Union. And for that, we needed those six uh, uh, countries working together, the so six candidate and aspirant countries. We needed uh, the, um, particularly the European financial institutions and also some international financial institutions to agree with uh, our financial uh, plan and a new innovative way of financing the things. And we came up with a package of billions of, of, of euros to help them to address uh, this infrastructure uh, uh, um, issues. The Berlin process uh, uh, itself, a uh, very good idea uh, of uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel. Uh, we just helped to feed the content uh, uh, into it. That was exactly this regional approach uh, to the infrastructure, uh, the transport and, and energy. Um, enlargement money, uh, uh, regular assessment of, of progress in enlargement. Show me another case in the world where uh, we in, in Brussels have on, uh, on a regular basis uh, uh, the most uh, uh, detailed and I would even say delicate report of how the country, uh, uh, including Turkey, Serbia and Kosovo, are doing uh, when it comes on fulfilling uh, the, the conditions uh, for joining the European uh, uh, Union. So that's another extremely important and powerful uh, uh, instrument. Uh, uh, and uh, you can imagine uh, how stressful it was not only for me and my team, but also my successor each and every time. I mean, to put, put together as objective uh, uh, X-ray of of the candidate and, and, and uh, uh, of the candidate countries and aspirant countries. Intergovernmental conferences. Uh, I already mentioned uh, the thirty-five uh, uh, chapters. Uh, um, uh, the more we open those chapters with uh, uh, those we currently negotiate. Uh, and uh, uh, and if we opened uh, the negotiating process with others, the bigger we have again the influence uh, 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 and the transformative influence in those uh, in those countries. Conditionality, Serbia and Kosovo, enhancing the dialogue between them. I'll leave it also for the Q and A if uh, if anyone uh, interested. Um, and I, and there is. One thing uh, I need to uh, share with you, uh, what we cannot do, because otherwise the sky is limit. Uh, actually, the consensus is limit. Oh, we might say money is the limit, but, but you can do a lot. But there is one thing where uh, uh, I was unable to move the th things. My successors are in the same position, and it is if a member state uh, raised some bilateral issues vis-a-vis -vis the candidate country and insists that this issue needs to be solved, of course, fairly, objectively, uh, before uh, uh, this chapter opens, the negotiations open, or before this, before, before this candidate becomes the member state, there's nothing you can do about it. And I had a lot of discussion with Croatia at the time they were joining uh, the European Union. I was even um, um, the last minute suggesting some, some language, some kind of declaration on their side that once being uh, uh, a part uh, of the EU, they will be conducive uh, uh, to the enlargement process uh, in, in the region and not to uh, uh, put uh, 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 a prospect of any Western Balkan countries as a hostage uh, uh, some open ballot issues. And, and unfortunately, uh, that has not happened uh, uh, as, I, as I imagine. Now, uh, do we have uh, uh, UK and uh, uh, online also? 
Yeah, Brexit. Uh, Brexit is important. Uh, 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 it's not important that it happened at the time, and it's not important because the European Union has uh, lost 16 percent of its economy. Uh, it's important because of the two things. We lost one of the most powerful foreign and security player in the globe and of course in our neighborhood. And second, and even more important, because I, I've always been respecting uh, uh, um, the, the will and the decision made uh, by particularly by the people, uh, uh, like the one uh, uh, they have shown to, uh, during this referendum. Uh, but I have this issue with this Brexit. It's not about the UK, it's about us. Because what uh, uh, Prime Minister David Cameron at that time has been able to negotiate with the European Commission, which negotiated on behalf of all the EU member states, was a paper, informal paper, to meet actually all the difficulties of the UK uh, to the point that the European Union would accept that the euro is not the only currency, that uh, uh, the uh, that you know that there are some limitations to the freedom of movement. You know, there were some issues, you know, which really were fundamentally challenging the pillars uh, of the European Union. Uh, I'm not sure, I mean, it would work, but I'm saying uh, that was the best chance we had. If this being, uh, uh, if, if, if there is a positive vote, and if David Cameron that would insist, and now I want you know this paper to be turned to be implemented. This would be the best opportunity for us to uh, make a stop, looking around at that crossroad, and choosing which of the road uh, 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 we would like to go when it comes to the future of the European Union. And and I was very sad uh, when I particularly compared this Cameron paper and Bratislava declaration. Slovakia was at that time um, uh, 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 presiding over the European Council uh, uh, and, and, and the meeting of the heads of states uh, took place in, in Bratislava and they reacted through this Bratislava declaration on the uh, results of the Brexit. And if you, if you read those two documents, those are two different organizations, those are two different roads, those are two different perspectives of the European Union. Uh, Brits leaving the European Union took away from us this opportunity to make a stop. That's what I have problem with. Otherwise, good luck. And uh, being privileged to serve there as an ambassador. I know that you will be doing very, very well. Uh, now, uh, listen, I have put forward here, uh, uh, or put among my notes, uh, the resume of instruments, but uh, I think you got by now already uh, an idea uh, 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 about all these instruments. Uh, uh, so I will, I will skip it. I will. I will just mention something that I put uh, uh, as, a num as a point number eight, uh, current trends. And this is interesting because uh, uh, we have uh, uh, two processes. We have uh, the conference on the future of Europe, which uh, should be uh, addressing number of those issues I've been referring uh, to. 
uh, uh, but unfortunately is not touching upon the most important one because for the enlargement to move, the European Union needs to move. Because I think it's clear to anyone by now that for the enlargement to happen, it, it's not only about the candidate countries to be ready, it's also about the European Union to be ready. And it seems to me that, uh, uh, I don't know whether most or whether uh, a smaller part of the European Union, and they are not ready. Uh, and they are saying it very, very openly. We will not move unless, you know, there are some other changes within the European Union, institutional and so on, uh, uh, for us to be able to, uh, you know, to, uh, to be still efficient uh, organizations with uh, uh, the new members. I mean, I, I would say that show me the case uh, of the 10 member states really blocking or making it difficult to, uh, for the European Union to move uh, uh, forward. Uh, um, we are a good scapegoat, scapegoat for uh, uh, a number of uh, older and bigger member states, uh, but we hardly uh, uh, have been blocking uh, uh, some uh, progress uh, um, here. Um, uh, but this conference is not addressing those issues. Ah, missed uh, opportunity. Huh? By the same time, uh, we are being pushed uh, by, you know, uh, our environment uh, uh, um, uh, to change ourselves. Green recovery, fit uh, for 55, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, that's one thing. The second thing is, you know, we, thanks God, uh, have still still consider ourselves to be a beacon of hope for those uh, who are not lucky enough to enjoy all those fundamental freedoms uh, and, and, and for the parts of, of uh, particularly the euro, but also beyond uh, uh, the words of human rights are sort of some kind of expression in dictionary, but nothing they can, they can, they can enjoy. Uh, and, uh, and it's interesting that uh, uh, as I'm now working with the Uzbek president, uh, as people coming uh, to me and say, uh, you know, Stefan, this enhanced partnership uh, and cooperation uh, agreement, it says something about the human rights here, but it, it, it has to be about trade now. And I said, um, good morning. You know, the world is changing, guys. You know, yeah, but but here, you know, this environment, you know, and. And what is that? what has to do? Everything it has to do everything with the trade. So uh, we came to the point uh, where we started to understand that what's really made us so not only big but also prosperous uh, was uh, our ability uh, uh, to make a free trade. Uh, to trade fairly uh, with the rest of, uh, of the world. And now uh, with, with China and its Belt and uh, Road initiatives, uh, uh, um, uh, taking this uh, uh, basis for fairness uh, um, uh, from our partners. And, uh, and I'm, I mean, if, if, the, if there is one thing I have been extremely enthusiastic about, uh, uh, hearing uh, news from the Brussels, it was about this gateway, uh, uh, global gateway initiative. This part of uh, what the US, uh, actually the whole G7 would call the build back better world. Uh, we have finally woken up. We have finally understood that, the, the, that this Belt and Road Initiative, it's not only about hardware. It's not about exporting the hardware. Actually, the Chinese foreign minister was so open in uh, the connectivity summit I participated uh, uh, in, in Tashkent in the, summer this, uh, in the summer this year, when he said in the plenary, he said, you know, for, for the China, uh, the BR, BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative is not only exporting uh, the hardware, but it's also ex ex exporting software. Oh my God. Yes, yes. 
We have not seen it for years. Huh? Even the Russians who uh, made a deal with the Chinese, I mean, to support, uh, you know, Belt and Road initiatives uh, 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 were telling me in, in Tashkent during this conference, uh, uh, um, 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 oh gosh, we leave it up, up to you. Huh? Uh, uh, we cannot do anything uh, uh, about it. Huh? We have not seen this uh, uh, coming. But they realized that uh, that's what uh, the Chinese are doing. They are coming with their own software. They are coming with their own rules, their own principles. Uh, 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 they are coming with the things which uh, transform the fair trade into something completely different. And I think these kind of things uh, are going to change us. Uh, um, I'm talking about it's going to change uh, our uh, our partnership is going to change our neighborhood. Uh, uh, it's clear to me that, uh, particularly seeing those recent initiatives, that uh, the mood is, is is switching from sort of uh, the European Union behind uh, uh, the the fences, uh, despite what's going on on the Polish uh, Belarusian borders. Uh, uh, but it, it, it's rather understanding that, uh, that you might not call it anymore a transformative uh, 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 power, uh, but you might uh, uh, call it uh, uh, building the alliances to support a global governance and different rule-based cooperative uh, uh, structures. Uh, and our existence uh, and our future is very much linked uh, to that. Listen, I have uh, a couple of other points, uh, but the time is uh, running uh, running out. Uh, uh, I would like just to make uh, one or two sentences at the end. Uh, uh, in, in then, so -called... And we also have some questions, some very interesting questions. Very good, very, so... good, very, good, very good. In so-called nation, first world, there's no future for the European Union and member states would be paying heavy price. Uh, and uh, we must uh, adjust to a multipolar world with authority and regimes and with power politics uh, 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 to be able, particularly in our neighborhood, uh, uh, to uh, enjoy the results of uh, the transformative power of our policies. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, those who uh, still uh, are linked uh, uh, to this uh, uh, debate, uh, to this lecture. And now I'm also looking some of the questions. Uh, well, you have already 10 questions and the, you can choose. There is a question about the uh, um, a refugee crisis in Poland, Hungary, then about Ukraine. There is one question which is particularly interesting for me. What would you do differently in 2013, yeah. uh, knowing what would happen uh, with uh, Ukraine? Uh, uh, I, I don't see any. Ah, here, ah, you Q&A. OK, very good. Mm, good evening. I have a question regarding the current crisis at the border between Poland and Hungary with millions of refugees living millions of refugees living in human conditions. The US already announced further sanctions on Hungary. In your opinion, will, will this threat to be enough to contain Hungary's behavior? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I don't understand I mean, how the situation, the Polish-Hungary, Polish between the border between Poland and Hungary. Well, perhaps we can uh, rephrase that, uh, uh, Stefan. Uh, by uh, oh, perhaps uh, br bringing in what uh, uh, just uh, mentioned about uh, uh, Eastern new member states uh, uh, not having uh, uh, caused particular blockages in the EU decision making. Could perhaps immigration be considered uh, one of them? Uh, uh, look, there are two issues uh, uh, I would like to say in this regard. The first one, uh, I have a certain sympathy uh, how the Poles, Lithuanians, uh, uh, and Estonians perceive uh, uh, the current uh, uh, current crisis. 
because this is the way how you weaponize uh, uh, the migrants. I mean, thanks God, uh, to, because of the EU policy, the flights uh, uh, with the Turkish Airlines, the Belarusian aviation company, uh, uh, bringing particularly the migrants to cross uh, the, the, the border to the European Union and have stopped, uh, uh, thanks God, uh, uh, at least half of those uh, people, hundreds and hundreds, have been already uh, uh, sent back, uh, particularly to uh, Iraq. Uh, uh, but there is a plight of around 1,000, including the children, which is, of course, uh, a matter, a matter of, uh, of, of concern. Uh, um, you know, the one thing we have somewhere probably lost, we are someone, somewhere missed to understand. Uh, while the military, the weaponry, the hardware is still important, the conflict, uh, the competition, uh, uh, the war could be waged uh, by a different means uh, with a much more devastated uh, uh, impact uh, without even uh, declaring uh, uh, an open conflict uh, uh, to a country. Um, uh, and, and I have uh, uh, no doubt that this is a, a, a part of, uh, of, of that that Lukashenko is playing the dangerous, uh, uh, dangerous uh, game. And uh, I know a little bit uh, of a guy, I, I met him, I, I talked to him. He, but I talked to him at the time when there was still a chance that the part of him being Belarusians would mean uh, uh, not to get closer to the Moscow uh, and, and, and become a more and more European uh, 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 country. Now, after what has happened in Belarus, um, um, I mean, the, what remains as, as my sort of uh, uh, hopes uh, are, are not there anymore. Now, the new members, old members. Uh, I am extremely concerned about this uh, issue. Uh, it's not that I like what's uh, going on in, in Hungary and uh, how Orban uh, uh, is building his illiberal uh, uh, democracy. This is definitely not something we would like to see in my country uh, and, and definitely not something uh, what should be incorporated into the European Union, European Union Aki. But uh, at the same time, uh, I think what is missing on the part of the older member states, a certain humble understanding of this terrible experience of uh, the new members uh, uh, living under the totalitarian regime. You know, 40 years is enough to ripe your soul of your body. And all the time, the Western democracies were addressing, you know, one problem after another problem. Huh? Uh, uh, under in a, a democratic, uh, or within the democratic uh, uh, um, uh, discussion, with the democratic parties, uh, 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 you know, moving it forward, with the, with the civil society uh, addressing those issues. We have not. We have not, and, and just by adopting the European Union Aki, we are somehow uh, expected, you know, uh, all that 40 years of the older member states experience to uh, You're muted. You should uh, uh, unmute. I'm not anymore. I don't see you anymore. Huh? We can and, see you. Uh, 
So, so I, I see both of us, you know, are responsible for current uh, situation, both of us. And I don't see, I mean, how this uh, uh, current uh, uh, tactics uh, 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 by the institutions and by the Polish authorities, how they could sort of uh, bring us closer to the, uh, uh, to the solution. Uh, I just just one 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 thing because it, it's important uh, uh, to understand in the Czech Republic in Czech, actually Czechoslovakia because Slovakia uh, went through the same process we were still uh, one country after eighty nine there was a called uh, uh, lustration law purification law and uh, on the basis of that law you know the judges the politicians the people working uh, in in the public service uh, 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 and security service, you know, they could not have uh, studied in the past in certain Russian schools, or they could not uh, be uh, active uh, 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 colleague of the state secret service and all of that. Huh? And all of that was checked in archives and so on. So the whole society and particularly uh, the people on the top, they were screened not in Poland, not in Poland, because, you know, there was another transformation. We still had a communist party at that time, even after 89. In Poland, the communist party has transformed into a, a, a one left party. Uh, and the lustration has been a, a, a very vague process, actually never being done in a scale and magnitude. Uh, and death uh, uh, as in Czechoslovakia. So addressing those issues uh, uh, after 20, 30 years might be too late, but maybe it is important to address some of those issues. Maybe there, there might be some understanding from, 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 from the rest, but I'm far from, um, again, sort of uh, uh, joining the illiberal democracy like uh, attitude of, uh, um, of Orban. Uh, okay, another question. I have here one that might be interesting is from Christoph Meyer. Um, do you agree with the criticism that the EU prior to Russia's aggression against Ukraine in 2014 suffered from geopolitical blindness? If so, what do you think is needed for the EU to see better geopolitical risks and manage them better? No, no, we, 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 did, we did not. We did not. Look, look, you know. Um, you have to read uh, not only one or two books, you have to read a little bit more books and, and, and see sort of and open up your mind, you know, to uh, other issues. Uh, my country, uh, after 89, we wanted to become the EU and NATO member. You know what the Russians told us? And we, we had at the time the Russians military on our territory. They told us never. You should not become NATO member states. And we were saying, how come? We are a sovereign country. It's our decision. No third country is going to decide uh, how, what kind of friends uh, we would like, uh, 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 you know, to have, what, uh, what kind of commitments we would enter with uh, 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 other, other institutions. So uh, as the Warsaw Pact has been actually dissolved in, in, in Prague, the political decision has been uh, 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 taken in, in, in Prague, we made it very clear in, in our policy and, 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 and trumpeted uh, uh, very loudly for no one in the West uh, 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 to, to side with the Russians uh, that uh, uh, it is our sovereign right to choose what kind of security arrangements uh, uh, we would like to have. Now, if I accept this as a right for the Czechs, why should be the one to tell the other country, just because it's a little bit closer to Moscow, that you know, they do not have that right as me? Why? That's my first, uh, uh, my first part of, of reply. My second. I have given you an example in my, uh, uh, in my lecture that actually 
everyone knew about uh, uh, Russian attitudes towards NATO. But no one really uh, uh, was aware that they would uh, uh, take the European Union uh, membership even more aggressively. Uh, we visited uh, the European Commission was the last time in Moscow was March 2013 and I was there. I had a discussion with a Russian uh, vice minister. I don't know whether it was Kozakov. Uh, uh, day before before the meeting with the Russian government, because it was on the uh, every second year we had uh, the meeting either in Brussels or Moscow, government Russian government and Commission, and every six months at that time there was a summit, the EU Russia summit, as some of you might remember, and I and I understood that uh, uh, that uh, uh, that the Russians are starting to have that was for the first time starting to have really a big, big, big problem with the Eastern Partnership and the Association Agreement and DCFTA. Uh, and uh, uh, next morning, I, I, I told uh, Barroso, President Barroso and my colleagues, listen, um, uh, I, there's something uh, cooking up. Uh, I, we need really to raise this issue. And Barroso asked me to make uh, uh, it on behalf of the whole commission. And at that time, I, I made basically three points. Uh, the point number one was, uh, 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 listen, uh, your customs union and our uh, association agreements and DCFTA are not compatible when it comes to the membership. Meaning you can be either member of this or member of that, okay? And it's not a, of a political uh, uh, nature, the reasons, it's a legal nature. Huh? Because the customs union has been built on the basis of the experience of the European Union with the, with the uh, customs union commission uh, taking over a number of the external policies responsibility from the member states. So if we allow the Ukraine to become the custom union member states, or if they would, it's not about us allowing anyone uh, to become a member of this or that, but if, if Ukraine would become the member of uh, the customs union and now Eurasian Economic Union, and we would come out, yeah, but we have a deal and, uh, you, you know, please deliver on this on that. The Kiev would tell us, yeah, you have to go to Moscow because it's them who are in charge of that part of our economic uh, uh, sovereignty. Huh? Uh, uh, second, despite the point number one, uh, we told, and uh, Medvedev was prime minister at the time, uh, we still want our partners to have as good relationship with Russia as we aspire to have, taking into account all the culture, traditions, you know, political, uh, economic, uh, uh, and all of that. Absolutely. To the point that if uh, the partner would like to join this or that policy of the customs union or Eurasian Economic Union, we would be helpful in looking whether this or that policy is not in contradiction to the responsibilities undertaken uh, by our partners through the association agreement DCFDA. And if not, we would support this wholeheartedly. And third point uh, we uh, made was, uh, uh, let's not forget the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is the relationship between the European Union and Eurasian Economic Union, future Eurasian Economic Union. Because as the things are, uh, there were at that time, uh, each of the organization was following and building its own regulatory framework. And we made the point, if that continues, if, if we do not make an effort to make it compatible, we will be stuck with dividing line of economic and trade nature, which might be even more important than the number of the tanks uh, on, this, on this or that part uh, of, of the border. 
And Medvedev uh, um, uh, looked at us. Um, he said, oh, interesting. He paused uh, for like two or three seconds. And they said, uh, the next point on our agenda is uh, they have never come back. Uh, do I think uh, that uh, uh, if something uh, uh, would change if we raise this issue earlier? Hardly. Hardly. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, at that time, even the Russians uh, uh, didn't know how far they would be able to uh, uh, come. Uh, to get uh, what they uh, were supposed uh, was theirs, uh, uh, Crimea. Yeah. Can we just perhaps Thank say, um, um, uh, looking at some of the other questions and uh, uh, jumping here for a minute, uh, uh, if I may uh, ask a question that I very often ask my own students uh, uh, here in Manchester, it's a golden opportunity, a dream question for me to ask, in, uh, to ask you. Where do you think the external border of the European Union ought to be? Where does Europe end? Europe ends uh, where the, exactly at the point where the interests uh, of those coming in and the consensus of those who are already in collides together. This is exactly the border. That's a great answer. Thank you. Yeah, because if we agree that Tunisia is a European member state, uh, uh, there is a consensus. Uh, and if the Tunisia wants to become the European Union, I'm, I'm just pushing this argument a little bit, okay? Don't, don't jump out of, uh, uh, I'm, I'm addressing now those who are, whom I do not see. Uh, uh, but that's 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 the, the the best answer I could give you, particularly after the Georgian experience. You would not believe uh, uh, that just because of being afraid that Georgia might, in the future, uh, uh, to be more and more vocal when it comes to the membership aspirations. One member states in particular has blocked a reference to Georgia as a European state in the agreement between the European Union and Georgia. Because the EU, the Lisbon Treaty talks about the European state, huh? that you, you have to be a European, European state. Huh? It, it, it is exactly as I said, uh, uh, if all the member uh, states uh, uh, agree that Georgia is a member state, is a European state, and if we all agree that uh, it fulfills uh, of, of, uh, all the conditions, uh, uh, if the Georgians uh, would say, yeah, this is our ambitions and would prove uh, in a popular vote uh, that uh, this is indeed a long-term policy of theirs. But is there one country in the world where all 27 members of the European Union agree that they are European and that country also agreeing that they want to be part of the EU? Or is enlargement done? I mean, look, look at this point of the time, the uh, European Union cannot agree even on the uh, Western Balkans. Okay. As sad as that. Huh? Yeah, I'm just looking at the time. Um, Mr. Fuller, do you want, is there in this row of question, the question that you would still- I, really I still like, have the time. That you would like to answer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'd also, or, or we have one one question, which is from, from our colleague Asim Dandashli. Um, how does the democratic black backsliding in some EU member states affect the transformative power of the EU in the neighborhood, especially when it comes to democracy support and promotion? Uh, uh, listen, uh, non-diplomatic uh, uh, answer would be uh, taking into account that the European Union currently does not really have a high aspirations 
to exercise its transformative power uh, in this neighborhood, uh, 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 the impact is only limited. But uh, 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 if this continues uh, uh, for a longer period of time, and if the EU would re-energize the enlargement, particularly the enlargement policy, that, that, that might be a problem. Because uh, uh, already at the time of uh, the second Barroso team I was part of, this issue has been already uh, on, the, on the table, not particularly the, the I mean, even the Hungary already uh, uh, at that time, but not only. And um, we with uh, Commissioner Redding uh, uh, um, came out because we, we both understand, I mean, how dangerous it is uh, uh, to have sort of the two ways uh, uh, how to uh, measure uh, uh, the commitments to the values. I mean, once you are outside and you try to get in and once you are inside, uh, we just, uh, you know, close at least one eye, if not, uh, if not both of them. And, and, and she came out with this idea of, of, a, of, a, of a board uh, uh, where would uh, uh, you list all those important commitments from the Lisbon Treaty and, and, and so on. And I, um, and I think it's, it's evolved uh, uh, to a certain extent. Uh, I don't think it, it does delivers on the original expectations of her mind and number of the member states who pushed us actually to do something like uh, like that yeah but uh, uh, that's a fair point I mean once we are not able to make sure that uh, uh, the values are respected and rules apply to all of us uh, I mean how come we could uh, uh, be strong enough uh, and credible enough? Um, uh, to expect our partners um, uh, to do the, exactly that. Alina, you still spot a question. Uh, I mean, there are 12 questions, so if, if you can stay for a few hours, there is still something to answer, but... Uh, just and I, I would like just to remind that there will be also this interview from... Uh... Yes, but one more question, please, Alina. You must have spotted a, a one that you prefer, because Dimitris picked one, I picked two. Which one would you like? Uh, yeah, I, I like the one which you uh, asked partly, but uh, I could um, yeah, uh, continue. What would you do differently in uh, yeah in fall to, uh, 2013 if you knew how the situation between Russia and Kyiv uh, developed? Nothing. Nothing. Under the circumstances, with uh, the knowledge and instruments I had uh, in my possession. I would uh, uh, act exactly the same, uh, the same, uh, in the same way. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, there, uh, the lessons learned uh, uh, when I was referring to the three mistakes, uh, 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 I, I, uh, I raised them with one of my last meeting with the foreign ministers of the European Union. Safari will. I, I shared with them sort of these lessons learned uh, of of of, uh, uh, of us uh, 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 failing uh, um, uh, in in Ukraine. Uh, although the history uh, uh, has not been yet uh, completely written about uh, uh, about this uh, about this issue. Um, I think the biggest, uh, the biggest problem uh, was indeed the one which I mentioned as the second uh, lessons learned. Um, that uh, if you have a very ambitious uh, agenda towards a one partner who is in a, in a complicated relationship with another bigger partner, and you don't have any ambitious uh, uh, agenda 
consensual, strong policy towards this, you are aiming at uh, difficulties. Well, like this one, Constantin Achilles, uh, he wrote, uh, wow, could you please share with us thoughts and reactions, Macron's proposition radically overhaul the enlargement process. This is just taking time. Huh? I mean, this is like, uh, uh, with all due respect, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I, I mean, there is so much of what has been done with enlargement. I mean, I was doing this huh, when I was commissioner to please uh, uh, the member states. Uh, 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 um, there is uh, uh, one thing, uh, and it's coming back to uh, Brexit. I liked very much uh, the British idea about uh, the European Union of various orbits. I, I, I started to question uh, uh, the mandate of the commission and it was only after I left the, the commission to be able to prepare uh, the candidate uh, 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 like the countries from the Western Balkans to be really able to deliver on all the obligations and to fulfill all the expectations of uh, not only the institution, but all member states since the first uh, day they become the member states. Uh, and, uh, and I, and I was, uh, uh, and that happened when I was still a commissioner. I, towards the end of my uh, mandate, I was talking more and more about, uh, about the you going through a certain transformation uh, 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 to ensure that those member states which have uh, uh, difficulties to imagine how the EU would work, uh, that those sort of uh, uh, worries uh, uh, are uh, uh, taken, care, uh, taken care of. Uh, but I, I don't see that uh, happening anytime soon. So, um, you know, and, and it's, and it's a it's a pity. Huh? I mean, uh, I mean, look, uh, we there was one thing I was extremely proud, and this is what what made uh, uh, this, what has made the European Union really great. When we promised something, we delivered uh, on our promise. When we promised that the country uh, candidate country A fulfills this and that we move them on the uh, on the chair on the stairs of the enlargement process we always delivered and that was this uh, this uh, this conditionality which worked and has been broken it's a broken machine now huh the macedonia has changed name we promised the membership and uh, look how long it uh, uh, it's it's still it's still an open issue. Uh, so it's it's it it's bad. That that's exactly what's making you know the Chinese and Russians you know so relax uh, in that uh, in that regions uh, uh, because they 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 feel that uh, you know it's uh, it's it's not the same game. Huh? they have seen uh, in Central Europe. And, and this is something uh, uh, we all be paying the price for sooner or later. So I, I don't see, I mean, how the, those two particular countries would, would make this region more stable and more EU friendly. I think that's a very uh, good point for us all to reflect and uh, um, thank the former commissioner for what I thought was an, an absolutely a marvelous presentation, very far uh, uh, reaching, you know, with, uh, I, I feel I've learned a lot, um, a, a lot of food of thought. So uh, very best regards from Manchester. Thanks for uh, for coming. Uh, and I'll, I'll pass you over to uh, to my colleagues in Maastricht. Also, okay, from, 
Also from our side, Mr. Fühle, it was such a great honor and pleasure to have you with us. I think what uh, what I, I enjoyed most was also to hear from, yeah, for, not from our books, something that our books can never tell us is, you know, the experience also what happened yeah, on the on the working floor. And I think uh, this is a perspective that very often we miss um, and that we, I think we very much benefit from and uh, we greatly appreciate that you that you came yeah, and answered our questions uh, also today. Um, so that was, uh, yeah, that was fantastic. So thank you. Thank you so much also on behalf of the team in Maastricht um, that you joined us this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you for making me happy to talk about these uh, things. Uh, uh, I was so enthusiastic uh, at that time in particular, um, uh, and I'm still a fan of it uh, uh, even nowadays. Thank you very much. All the best. Over thank to you Alina for our for the audience. Uh, thank you. And uh, Mr. Fle, I'm leaving you with Charel and uh, the students for further questions. Very good. Very good. Thank you, the audience. Goodbye. Thanks. All the best. <laughs>